welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and hopefully you, our listeners, can't tell, but it's been a while since we did this. We're engaged in a time warp, so uh, it's good to be back with you after a couple of weeks, and we're continuing our discussions guided by the book of Joshua. And we're going to talk about a favorite topic of the new atheists, that is the conquest of Canaan. We're going to discuss whether the Lord Yahweh is guilty of genocide. What do we think? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Can we just stop there? Yeah. And... That would be nice. Let's move on to the next yeah. episode no. right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, first we need to define genocide, right? All right. Well, let me read from something I wrote once upon a time. The word genocide is a modern one. It was coined in 1944 by Raphael Lemkin, a brilliant legal scholar originally from Poland, Jewish by descent. The word literally means killing a tribe. Lemkin's first definition was narrow, the destruction of a nation or of an ethnic group. He quickly enlarged it to include, quote, a coordinated plan aiming at the destruction of essential foundations of the life of national groups with the aim of annihilating the groups themselves. He included within his definitions attacks on culture, language, religion, and social and political institutions. He, uh, his work grew out of familiarity with the Turkish slaughter of Armenian Christians during the First World War. And, and here's a proper name, I don't know, Samil Massacre of um, Christian Assyrians in Iraq in 1933. His most important work, Axis Rule and Occupied Europe, published in 1944, looking at some of Nazi Germany's practices. So there you go for definitions, concept of wiping out an ethnic group, a people group, a nation, deliberately. I, I assume that doing it accidentally doesn't quite count, but you actually have to be focused, uh, intent on destroying said people group. And when we look at the Torah, particularly Deuteronomy, although it begins as early as Exodus, and Joshua, we see God's commands to Israel to destroy the Canaanites. So I think the first thing we probably should do is be very specific about what God said, and then secondly, mm -hmm. very specific about why God said it. Uh, the first thing is that although he says, basically kill them, kill them all, it's in the context of kill them if they don't leave, kill them if they don't run away. Yeah. The point is they're being driven out of the land, they're, right? Yeah. They're being removed from the land. If they all wanted to get up, pack up, and leave, then God did not say, and go hunt them all down and make sure not one survives. That wasn't part of the agenda. The agenda was to secure the land for Israel and to drive out these people. And then the second question is, well, why? Was it simply a matter of dispossession and inheritance? They have the land. God wants his people to have it, so they need to go. Or is there something more? And as we read through the law and on into Joshua, and into Judges for that matter, we see that God's um, intentions have to do with the, the religious, uh, religious mm -hmm. and ethical character of the Canaanites. Yeah. They were really, really wicked. <laughs> they practiced child sacrifice, ritual prostitution of both sexes, bestiality, uh, self-mutilation, all other kinds of wickedness in the name of religion. These were the good points. This was what they thought God, their gods, wanted of them. This was the best they had to offer. And their religious rituals were very seductive, as Israel found. Israel was, in the years of follow was constantly being pulled into uh, ritual fornication or just good old-fashioned marriage with your pagan neighbors that leads you into idolatry. And since God's goal in all of this is the preservation of his worship, his word, and the messianic line, uh, this poison, this cancer in humanity was simply too deadly to tolerate. God says it needs to go. Now, if they want to leave, go join another host body someplace else, that's something else. But if, since this is the land, first of all, it's God's land. He owns the earth. He can give it to whomever he wants. That's huge. Something people have a problem with. But they were there first. You no, know, God's here first and God actually made it. So. Yeah, and the, the first <laughs> like 
how far back do you want to go with any yeah. given plot of land? <laughs> yeah. God can give it to them. God says he's going to give it to them. God's, and here's another thing. God promised them 400 years earlier. He promised to Abraham that his seed would inherit this land. But he said, but not yet, because the iniquity of these Canaanites, mm -hmm. these Amorites, isn't full. Uh, and it's going to take some time. God gave them time to mature in wickedness. Now, in theory, that was also a, an opportunity to repent. Mm -hmm. And unless some say, well, that's impossible. No one would ever change their religions. There actually were a few people who did. <laughs> See Nineveh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Nineveh repented uh, wholesale at the preaching of one man who all whose only message was, you're about to die. Uh, in the context of Canaan specifically, we, we all know the one famous woman, the prostitute, Rahab, who did repent, uh, joined Israel's side. But then we also have a, a city called Gibeon mm -hmm. that decided they didn't want to leave, but they didn't want to die. And so they bamboozled Joshua and the elders and pretended to be from far away and got a promise out of them. That, that Israel wouldn't kill them. And then lo and behold, wow, you just live over the hill. That's not cool. But we weren't Israel supposed was... to make a treaty with you. Yeah. But we were dumb. Now. <laughs> yeah, we, we swore by the name of God. So, and from this, I think we can extrapolate that repentance would have saved the Canaanites, but it wasn't going to happen generally. It happened a little bit. And it's interesting that the repentance of the sort involved deception. I mean, it kind of reminds you of Jacob, right? Pretending mm. to be Esau in order to get the <laughs> blessing. Uh, that's a good observation because both Rahab and the Gibeonites did practice a certain degree of deception in, in, in switching sides. Now, some people will look at this and say, but what you're talking about is religion. Doesn't everyone have a right to their own religion? Isn't that one of the basic guaranteed <laughs> freedoms of mankind? Who is this God of yours to tell people they can't worship other gods? Oh, what a child of the Enlightenment you are. <laughs> well, Funny, yeah. you know, the, one of the preconditions for the Enlightenment is actually <laughs> Christianity. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway. If there is no God who speaks, then we have real problems on all fronts. But specifically, once you admit, well, what are we going to do here? No, your God, although he's the creator, doesn't get to say who gets to be worshipped. He should just let people worship. Sure, if they <laughs> want to worship um, sticks and stones, your God should let them, because that's a basic human right. What are we even talking about at this point? <laughs> God's God, if you want to say, well, no, your God is no more real than all these other gods. I mean, every God is its own reality and gods exist only in the minds of their believers. And therefore, your faith doesn't get to nudge other people's faith aside. We're back to some kind of extreme relativism. Well, that's kind of where we live these days, I guess. Uh, but the Bible knows nothing of that. God claims to be the God of the whole earth in the most literal sense. He owns the planet. He is the not absentee landlord, the very imminent yet transcendent landlord, the sovereign landlord who can give and does give the planet to whom he will and gives life and breath to all men and takes it away at his discretion. Uh, one thing we'll, we'll, we'll come back to eventually is, yeah, God ordered a lot of people to be killed. God takes people's lives every day. He tells us over and over again, I kill, I make alive. People don't like that. They want to see death as just this thing that happens and that God brings someplace wringing his hands, wishing he could save people from dying. And boy, isn't it sad? No, God actually ends people's lives in his sovereignty. So one of our big problems here, in fact, probably the big problem in all this discussion is coming to terms with who the God of the Bible claims to be. Now, if you don't want to believe it, that's your business, but then you have some questions to answer. Uh, if you want to maintain any kind of claim to rationality. If you don't want to claim to be rational, okay, but then don't blame us because we are rational because you don't <laughs> want to be rational and you don't. there's no reason we should follow you in your rationality because you got no reason at all because you're not rational. You mentioned the, the new atheists. I've got a quote from Richard Dawkins from The God Delusion 2008. He speaks of our Lord as a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, 
That's a new word. Megalomaniac. <laughs> men, I can't say that. Megalomaniacal. Cole, there you go. <laughs> Sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. In other words, he does stuff I don't like. And it involves people and what they have to do. He actually tells people to do stuff that I think they should be fine doing. And so God's bad. And so that, that brings us to a couple issues. First of all, this is probably the order we should have gone in, but I've kind of committed this. The question is, that is God evil? Now, that's an interesting question. <laughs> is Based God on what? <laughs> Based on what? Now, you can mean a couple things by that. You can mean that you look at the Bible and you see what the Bible says about who God is and what he has, what he tells us about himself and what he standards he sets for us and say, God is not living up to his own standards. That's kind of a tenuous track because remember, God's not us. God says to us, thou shalt not kill, but he kills every day. He tells us we should not steal, but he owns everything and takes stuff from people all the time. And so we, we, we have this issue of God's standards for us do not apply back to him the way they apply to us. Now, God, Trinitarian God, is absolutely faithful, absolutely pure. He keeps covenant to a thousand generations. He keeps covenant among himself forever and ever, from eternity to eternity. Uh, so in terms of that, yeah, God is faithful to himself. Nothing he commands in Scripture is it all contrary to who he is? And you would have to produce some kind of heavy exegetical argument from Scripture to proceed any further along this road. A mild surface reading of saying, well, God God is love, and yet he killed all these people, so that's a contradiction. No, you have to do things like define what in the world love is, mm -hmm. and why did he kill all these people, and was it not loving to kill the evil people that are trying to destroy the promise that will save the world? You know, it gets a little more complicated than just all this blood makes me feel bad. Uh, there's, there's, there's more to talk about. Now, pulling back from that, the other thing that more often these critics mean is we have a standard that is not in Scripture because we don't like Scripture. We do not approve of Scripture. But this standard, whatever it exactly may be, um, says that you should love everybody and not commit mass murder. Your God apparently does not love everybody and does order mass murder. Therefore, your God is evil. Uh, at which point we say, all right, what standard is this exactly? Where did you find it? Why is it binding on anyone? And in particular, why would it be binding on the God who made the universe? Now, again, if you want to say God doesn't even exist, then you're saying that this fiction we've created is violating a rule that you've created, and your, your literary creation, your fiction is better than our fiction. I think that's a literary argument on the order of it's DC or Marvel better. Yeah, it's uh, a, why should it bother you that our fiction is objectionable to you? Yeah, it's you don't want to you don't want to go watch our movies. That's fine, but that's not an, a, a real argument of any sort uh, to appeal to anything. I mean, where, where will you appeal? Well, most people of most times have thought that killing lots of people is bad. Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Genghis Khan, uh, the American abortion industry, the Soviet Union, the SS. No, most people in most times have not thought that mass murder is wrong. A lot, a lot of people have. A lot, a lot of people apparently think it's just fine given the right circumstances. But even if you could get that consensus, let, let us say that somehow we could take a, a vote of all the human beings who have ever lived to this point, and more than 50% of them said, yes, mass murder is wrong. So what? Why should that bind anybody? Why should I let other people define my standards of living, how I will then live? Let alone how should a God who claims to stand outside of humanity to be, in fact, the maker of humanity, who transcends our physical reality on all levels, why should he care what we think? Oh, why should it do any more than perhaps abuse him or anger him? What kind of argument is this? Will you see? Will you look for something rational above God, more rational than God? There's some kind of rational 
thing that says we don't kill people. Well, where is this idea? This is it a natural law? Well, God created nature. Uh, is it behind nature? Is it supernatural? Is it you know where, where is this thing coming from? Uh, the moment you say God is evil, you are admitting that there is some kind of moral absolute in the universe, which is a big mistake if you want to argue for atheism. But at the same time, you're saying, and God's not it. Well, then you have a God who's bigger than God. You have some ultimate authority. And then that gets embarrassing. So once you know what this ultimate authority says, and by the way, how do you know that? Have you obeyed all of its standards? You don't like oh, the God of the Bible telling you you're a sinner. How about this other authority? Have we just shifted from one God? To another? So the whole thing is a, is a bunch of nonsense. Before now, Emily, you've brought up uh, Van Til's parable. Actually, it was a... I think it was a real incident on a train where he saw a little girl climbing up into her grandfather's lap so she could slap him. <laughs> the human She can only reach his face because <laughs> he let her onto his lap. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and these, these new atheists have to assume a Christian idea of moral absolutes in order to attack the God whose moral absolutes they actually are appealing to. Mm -hmm. Um and so it's it's a self-defeating argument. And it, it, if it weren't so s tragic and so sinful, it would be rather amusing. Something that, that ties into all this, though, is the question, well, if God ordered Joshua to go out and kill Canaanites <clears throat> because of their perverse religion, does that style still bind Christians today? Should we go out with swords or machine guns and exterminate particularly wicked people of the world who practice perverse religions or perverse morality or a threat to, say, the church. You can think here of uh, people who've advocated uh, assassinating abortionists or assassinating uh, extremely wicked liberal political leaders uh, or waging war on entire countries because they're evil and are a threat to us all. And to make sense of this, I think we have to fall back a ways and get a big picture here. The Bible here and there, often just in passing, speaks of the wars of Yahweh, the wars of the Lord, or the battles of the Lord. And these, the, the way this phrase is used is not that Israel has battles, and by the way, we hope God's on our side. The point is that God has a battle to fight, and he expects his people to be on his side. But that battle or those battles take different forms at different times. Now, the battle is for the life of the world, for the salvation of his people. God sent his son into the world that the world through him might be saved. That's the goal. And there are a lot of things, particularly the first 4,000 years of human history, that tried to get in the way of that. And most of them were directly or indirectly motivated by Satan, his demons, the powers of darkness. Uh, they were very, they, they understood the threat in the garden. There's going to be this hero, this seed of the woman, and he's going to crush the serpent's head. Uh, he's going to win. You're going to lose. and he, But he's going to come into this world in some sense by natural birth. He's going to be human, at least human. And so real, real early on, the devil wages a warfare against that promise against God. He can't go to God directly and attack God, but he can attack God's work and he can attack God's promise. He can attack God's people. And throughout history, Satan's strategy, uh, I believe there are basically three things. One, kill them, kill them all, because that would work. Two, lead them into idolatry so that God kills them all. Or three, get them married to unbelievers so that their children will defect and then see point two above. Satan is not original. He's not creative. And that's pretty much what he's got to work with. If he can turn God against his own promises, he can turn God's holiness and justice against his grace and love, then this fight might have a chance. And so for the first 4,000 years of human history, we see God pushing his promise through history, defending it, and at times obliterating the enemy. Now, you, you start with Cain, and the battle there is very simple. Get out of here, stay away, until God's people go after them and intermarry. 
Then there's this flooding of an entire planet and destroying a worldwide population someplace between a few million and a few billion people. Not to mention all the bunny rabbits and squirrels. God did not approach that one with sweetness and gentleness. He, we, we really need to take this seriously. God destroyed the planet. Uh, the entire civilization that spanned the, spanned the globe, it's gone. It's buried. On the other side, there's the Tower of Babel. And again, people are turning against God's promise. So God doesn't resort to a lot of violence on this occasion. He simply splinters human language to create nation groups who will inevitably fight each other for territory resources and such. And as we go down through history, we, can, we come to the patriarchs who do very little fighting. Once or twice, they get engaged in some kind of armed conflict, but mostly they're just sheep herders and prophets and doing their own thing and minding their own business, waiting for the promise until we end up in Egypt and Egypt tries to enslave God's people and, and then destroy them all. And God intervenes again with blood and frogs and locusts and hailstone and fire and the death angel and the crashing down Red Sea. And then on the other side, finally God's people really for the first time pick up swords and take on the Amalekites. And they don't really do a whole lot else until we come to Joshua. And then from Joshua through Judges and through the beginning of the reigns of uh, Saul and David, we see God's people taking up swords to defend a particular geographical plot of land that has very specific promises with it. Uh, during the kingdom era, there's not a whole lot of that. In fact, often God's people are fighting each other. Sometimes they're fighting Syria or the Philistines or somebody to maintain their existence. And then they go into captivity and they really, except for the brief Maccabean conflict, they never really take up swords again. Mm -hmm. So as we, as we scan this whole panorama of biblical history, the time during which God put swords into his people's hands and said, here, swing this, use the pointy end, are, 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 is not the major point of it. Most of the time, God himself is walking through history, waging war against his enemies. Uh, by means sometimes subtle, sometimes extremely violent and wholesale. Sometimes very confusing. <laughs> I mean, Jesus going into the wilderness to do battle with the devil. Yeah. That, it's not intuitive. That doesn't look like a battle to us. No. And I, I think at least as I was growing up, I think I saw that as just sort of Jesus the victim. Mm. And I was much, much older before I understood, wait, Jesus did this. The Holy Spirit moved him deliberately. Jesus went deliberately to face Satan. This, this was combat. And Jesus blew the devil away. He, but it wasn't the kind of battle we're used to or are used to historically to that point. But often because we've been misreading, because it is the kind of battle we fight every day. We don't. We can't pull out a sword or a lightsaber, or a wand of demon banishing, and and take on the devil. We we have to stand by faith and by the promises of God, uh, by the work of the Spirit. So, with the coming of Christ, with His definitive, redemptive or His death, resurrection, and ascension, the outpouring of the Spirit, we we've entered a new phase of the conflict. Yeah, we still, if a mugger tries to attack us, we, we have permission to defend ourselves. Someone tries to break into our house, we have permission to pull out a shotgun. Um, a foreign nation invades ours, we have permission to uh, join uh, a regular army and defend our liberties and our, our families. In each of those cases, we're not being targeted as Christians. It's not because of not our primarily. role in society as a Christian that no. the mugger has... No, well, it, whereas it may, right, it may be a Christian duty, but it's not a normal part of the Christian life. We're not right. commissioned to go around stopping muggers and then evangelizing them or some such thing. <laughs> <clears throat> Although we can. I mean, once once we've brought him down and have his knife, we can say, oh, look, bud, while we're waiting for the police, I've got a story to tell you. <laughs> Although if someone world. comes at you with a knife, there's no stopping him, just run. <laughs> Guns are different. Guns you can yeah. stop. No, no knives. <laughs> I mean, also just to sort of add to what you're saying is, you know, with, with the coming of Christ, we, we no longer have a paradigm that is, you know, th this is the nation mm -hmm. that 
God has chosen to bless because that right. that role has now been full. Uh, it's found its fulfillment in the everlasting covenant people, which is the church. Uh, those yeah, the who church are, is the holy nation of priests. Yeah. Yes, and so you know we, we 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 can't say anymore. England is God's country, or uh, Poland is God's country, in a way that any other nation is not also God's country. Right. <laughs> and he does own them all. He does own all of them. Uh, there, there, there's two ways to answer the question, are Christians supposed to go around killing people? The, the, the first answer is no, because mm-hmm. we don't have a, a particularly Christian nation that's under attack by specifically satanic nations because they realize we're a Christian nation or anything like that. Um, and the second is, well, yes, if by killing them, you mean letting them die to the flesh by mm-hmm. telling them the gospel. And the image that the Spirit uses in Revelation 19 is of Christ uh, galloping through history on his white horse, slaying the nations with the sword of his mouth mm-hmm. and the armies of heaven, I'd be us follow along in his train. Uh, He's the one who does the fighting. And it's not, again, it's not phasers or lightsabers or um, B-52s or some such thing. It's it's the word of God, the sword of the spirit. And so, yes, and and this is a question I've been asking my kids at school a lot lately. And I think they pretty well have figured it out. When the Bible talks of destroying a sinner, when the prophecies of the Old Testament talk about destroying a sinful nation, Moab or Edom or something, what can that mean? And they, they're very good at it. Well, it can mean that they're going to die. It can mean they're going to be converted. They're going to, those those people as they were will die to self, as you say, die to the flesh mm-hmm. and be raised to newness of life. That, of course, is the right answer. The Old Testament regularly speaks in terms of the, of the Messiah's kingdom, in terms of slaying his enemies. But when we get to the New Testament and the New Testament starts reinterpreting that force and setting our hermeneutics straight, we see that at least in many cases, what that means is the conversion of these peoples. Uh, that's how we get that's how we get rid of the bad guys. We went them to Christ. On the uh, road to Damascus, Tar, Saul of Tarsus died and the Apostle Paul rose in his stead. And so this is our new commission, our great commission. And the Great Commission is the New Testament corollary of what Joshua was commanded. Joshua, whose name is Jesus, led the armies of Israel with an iron sword to take the promised land. We follow in the pathway of our Joshua, our Jesus, who with the sword of the Spirit is also conquering the world, but he slays people by bringing them to resurrection life. So yes, at one time, God did that. That time has passed for the reasons you've described. Thank you, Brian, for dealing with that. Uh, it's historically, redemptively, we're not where we were. Uh, mm-hmm. And for now, and until Jesus comes, we, we likely aren't going to be there ever again. But there will be a day when Jesus will come back. And it will no longer be to pass out tracts or go on Christian radio or make guest appearances on Christian TV and try to winsomely win people to Christ. He will come in fire and glory blasting his enemies to pieces. It will not be a pretty sight. And no He's not one is going to be the uh, keynote speaker at a Christian conference. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that time has passed. He, he came once, meek, mild, humble, smoking flax. He does not quench. But when he comes again next time, it will be in glory and power. And the, the wars of the Lord will change tone and timber very dramatically, real fast as angels accompany him in flaming fire. So God is consistent. God does not change. But our historical circumstances, this this prism through which God reveals himself, uh, does change. We, we see history before Jesus came. We see history before God selected a people and gave them a particular land that needed to be defended for particular reasons. Now we see Jesus enthroned in heaven, but it's the same God, it's the same grace, it's the same justice and holiness, but history by definition is a place of transition, of change and development. 
but there are absolute standards that govern this, and they are rooted in the very character of God himself. And for that, we don't apologize. Mm -hmm. We have absolutes. Yeah, we were talking about uh, the death of the sinner as dying to sin and to self. One of the most beautiful aspects of Lutheran hermeneutics is this constant idea that every week what the preacher does is bring the law to kill the listener, to kill the sinner, mm. to kill the sin, and the gospel to raise to life. And that's, if you have a confessional Lutheran pastor, that's what they're doing every single week is they're saying, here's the text, in here are law and gospel, how mm. do we rightly divide those? And I mean, it's, I think there are more robust hermeneutics, covenant mm. theology, but as a starting point, I think it's a pretty good division to draw in in scripture and a, a nice tool to use as you're starting to learn to read through scripture and think about these different eras of redemptive history. It is easy in, in such a Lutheran hermeneutic, although not unavoidable by any means, to say this verse is law and this verse mm -hmm. is gospel. Mm. And um, that's a mistake. Yes. Um, the the issue is how are we receiving it? If you receive, repent and believe as a command that can be fulfilled in the flesh, it's still law for you. Mm -hmm. And if you hear the command that says love and fear the Lord as an offer of free grace where God's promising to change you, that's pure gospel. Yeah. And so we, we need to be careful. All that is law is holy and rooted in God's own nature. But as it comes to us, if, if we receive it as a bare command whereby we can grab hold of it and make ourselves alive, where the zombies can crawl out of the tomb, <laughs> then that's the flesh, that's the law in the negative sense, and that's nothing but corruption and danger. But yeah. however the word comes to us, and we see in it the goodwill of our God toward us in Christ, that he has said these things that we might live, and we trust him for their fulfillment in us rather than trying to do it ourselves, then we have gospel. So that'd be my only my only caution there, and I don't by mm -hmm. any means think that simply distinguishing law and grace by any means. Uh, well, and I, I think that I think mm -hmm. that that error certainly has cropped up in Lutheranism yeah. a lot. Uh, there was, of course, the Lutheran Pietistic movement mm -hmm. in the nineteenth um, century, I think it was, and of course, I can think of that in Scottish Presbyterianism as well. Yeah. We have the whole Marrow controversy, mm -hmm. where the argument, what the, the question was, does God require something of your own effort in order to be initiated into the kingdom? And the big issue with that was, who are you actually able to address the gospel to? Mm -hmm. What is the gospel message? Can mm -hmm. you tell someone, repent and believe, or is that casting pearls before swine if you uh, mm -hmm. accidentally give that to the non-elect? Reminded yeah. of Zwingli. Uh, slightly unrelated aspect of the Christian life, but Zwingli outlawing the singing of hymns and psalms in church <laughs> because he was worried that if they were not elect in church, then they would be keeping condemnation on themselves. I mean, at that rate, you might as well just not have church. Which, <laughs> yeah. which you can uh, do it at that point. Yeah. Do it in your um, own home and, uh, you know, then it's on your own head. Yeah, we don't um, like that. <laughs> My roommate at college, one of them, was from a small reformed sect, which shall remain unnamed. But uh, the people in this, this little denomination were were warned that, well, they, they followed the Heidelberg Catechism, but they followed it in an overly literal me mechanistic fashion. Uh, you You need to know how great your sin and misery is before you can know how you're redeemed, before you can be oh. thankful. So until oh. you really know your misery, and by misery they understood an emotional condition of misery, you can't go forward. And since they're theoretically Calvinist, only God can make you miserable. So there's nothing you can do to make yourself miserable. Um, there's nothing the pastor can do to make you miserable. Uh, you can go to church and should. I'm not sure why that followed, but you did. If you're a covenant child, you go to church and you just sit there, not doing anything, not expecting anything, not hoping for anything, because that would all be fleshly. 
And maybe at some point, God's spirit will just strike through all of that and, and, and suddenly make you feel miserable. And then you can proceed to trust in Christ and so on. Sounds like Gnosticism. Where's my bell? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's hyper-Calvinism. Mm -hmm. Up to that point, I thought hyper-Calvinism was a myth. And then I found out, no, there actually are people <laughs> who believe this. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was down to, yeah, you can't tell people to believe because that would imply that they have some sort of natural freedom to do so. No, <laughs> that's not. It implies no such thing. It, it implies that God can supply the freedom through the very words you speak, should it be his good pleasure. And you have no idea what he has in mind. So quit trying to be smarter than God and do what he said and preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, and then don't be surprised when he blesses it. And yes. Someone. <laughs> yeah, that's the other oh, part of yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, wait, you, you sound like you're a Christian. What do I do now? What's the next? I mean, I actually came up across that once. I It's one of the great failures in my life, which got snatched out of the fire for me. But I was invited to talk to a couple people, a young, uh, prosperous couple who knew nothing about the Bible. They knew nothing about Christianity, but uh, a guy at their work had been witnessing to them and they were, they were beginning to come along. And I thought I was supposed to explain Christianity to them, and I, I did my the gospel or the the whole history of Scripture in you know an hour, which I do sometimes for people, and they really enjoyed it and really because they knew nothing like Samson, no, Noah, flood, no, oh yeah, we just bought a little book for our girls, and there was this, there was this boat with the yeah. giraffes, <laughs> with the giraffes, yeah, yeah, that one, and I got to the point of saying, well. I, it sounds like you're Christian. And rather than saying, for I think this is one of those horrible moments of being afraid I'm going to sound like an Arminian. But what you need to do is get down on your knees and ask Jesus, or, or, you know, just what I should have said is, I think you're ready to become Christians. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world? He died for you. Yes. Let's go get you baptized. Uh, I backed off and said, I think they are Christians. I, blah, blah, blah. Fortunately, about a week later, a, pa a pastor came on the scene and said, you're Christians. Let's get you baptized. Um, but it was one of those, yeah, being surprised at how powerful the gospel is in, in a circumstance that, I mean, these were wealthy, bright, handsome, intelligent, successful people, people you see in infomercials. Um, and, and I, I wouldn't God describe people I see in infomercials as intelligent or bright, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and God brought them to himself just like that. So, you know, we actually have to believe the gospel does have the power to change people's lives. And uh, I think sometimes we Calvinists are really bad at that. Mm -hmm. We misunderstand predestination. We misunderstand effectual calling. And we just sit back and, and know that only God can save people and, and kind of get the idea, well, of course, he'll probably save our kids because they were baptized as infants. <clears throat> <laughs> And then don't know what to do with the rest of the world. But if it's, if it's going to happen, God would do it. He probably won't because we're mostly all millennials. Because the matter. gate is wide and <laughs> destruction. Yeah. But we made it in, so we're okay. So, you know, we need – this is way far afield. But <laughs> the power of the gospel to change lives, not just hypothetically. I don't remember what this – yeah, I was talking to a young man whose marriage was was in danger and it, because his wife was not living up to a profession of faith. And I looked at this guy and said, do you believe in the power of God to change your wife's heart? I don't mean hypothetically. Mm -hmm. Like, well, yeah, of course he has the power and he could. No, I mean, do you believe he really can and will and maybe has already begun yet? And he was quiet for a while. He looked at me like, I don't. Well, of course you can, but I don't. And I think that's where a lot of us are. Mm -hmm. We of forget course, that God has told us his intentions in Scripture yeah, as well yeah. as of his power. His, yeah, he has the power. Well, what's his intention? He sent his son to be the savior of the world. Mm -hmm. So I, I suppose that does draw a nice conclusion to this. We look at times where God warred against sin, and that means against sinners. But his ultimate intention, and intention where we started is God sent his son to be the savior of the world. God loved the world in such a way that he gave his only begotten son. Yep. That the world through him might be saved. That's the intention. And if we're going to stand with Joshua, we not only say, yeah, Joshua, you were right to kill these people, 
We have to turn around and look at ourselves and we will only be right if we reach out to save these people. And yes, of course, the results are with God, but he's told us to be the means and we better get with it. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we look at the imprecatory Psalms, mm. you know, Lord, slay your enemies before you who, who blaspheme your name. And I, I think a lot of, you know, modern day Christians, evangelical types are a little bit, Oh, that's, uh, we don't like that. We don't want to, we don't want to mm. sing those. Those are, yeah. those are not the God that is, is loving in new Testament. There um, are whole books but, written to say Christians should not sing the imprecatory Psalms. Exactly. <laughs> or pray. Them. And, you know, I think you can, you can definitely take those and use them as ways of trying to get God to um, take down your political enemies. Yes. Uh, exact yes. your own vengeance. Yes. Exact your own vengeance uh, with, a, with a nice Christian veneer. However, the proper way of looking at them is to recognize that the penalty for your sin is described in those Psalms mm-hmm. and that Christ himself took those upon himself at the cross. The judgment, the death, the slaying for the most minor of your sins has been brought upon Christ. And we can pray those, we can sing those psalms with a clear conscience if we understand that we deserve that and Christ Mm -hmm. took it for us. That, yes, there will be people at the end of the age upon whom that judgment falls in the most literal sense and that it's our duty to bring the message of, of Christ, of his, uh, the gospel of Christ to as many people as possible so that God's elect will through that means be saved mm-hmm. and their punishment will fall on Christ instead. Amen. Yeah. Amen. All right. Let's wrap up with some recommendations. Yeah, I have a frivolous one, except it stops being frivolous the moment you actually have to do it. I recommend defrosting your refrigerator Oof, and yes. freezer <laughs> oh, no. on a regular basis before they get iced over and you have to suddenly, you know, late at night, find ice chests in neighbors' refrigerators and whatever to put all your stuff in so you don't lose it <laughs> while you're defrosting your refrigerator. Ours, in this case, wasn't that bad. Someone left the uh, freezer drawer open and it began to ice up the whole thing. So we had (coughs) a little bit of warning and it only took about five hours to defrost. But uh, yeah, we uh, vacuumed the coils and everything. And and I I know this. I saw this about two months earlier. This thing's a mess. The coils are filthy. I need to do something. And I didn't do it. So I ended up staying up to two in the morning finally putting everything back in the in the restarted freezer and praying that those numbers that were kind of going down on the temperature controls accurately reflected the future of the refrigerator because otherwise <laughs> in the morning everything would be spoiled and we'd have to buy you know a $2000 refrigerator so oh no address the problems up front be responsible and defrost your refrigerator freezer when you don't have a ton of stuff in it <laughs> and save yourself yeah. some money and 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 yeah, problems. So, funny story. Before we left for our honeymoon, my dear sweet husband um, tried to preserve as much food as possible in our apartment freezer. In fact, he tried to preserve so much that the door would not close. <laughs> so for three weeks, when we were not home, oh no, the freezer door was open. And so when I got home from the honeymoon, I cleaned out the freezer. <laughs> it was a fun time. <laughs> Did your refrigerator freezer still effort. work? I think it did. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was an adventure. Brian, I will. I think I will go next. Yes, I'm going to recommend road trips. Um, <laughs> I, as as some, I guess our listeners know. I don't remember how much I talked about it on here. Probably a lot. I have moved to Wisconsin, and uh, there is uh, a thing in wisconsin that california doesn't have and it's called the winter (laughs) where it snows a lot and i i came i moved here just at the tail end of it so i so far my wisconsin experience has been has been uh comparatively warm in comparison to the yearly average 
And so I, I get I get all the lovely spring and summer weather. We had a thunderstorm last night that was beautiful. Mm. Lightning just filling up the entire sky. I'm getting off track. Um, <laughs> but while the weather is nice and the roads are clear and you have less chance of black ice and things like that, it is very lovely and wonderful to just uh, drive wherever wherever you feel like it. Uh, we went up to Green Bay. Uh, my fiance and I, we went out to Viroqua, which is far on the west side of Wisconsin, a four hour drive out, uh, just seeing the beauty of God's creation. There, there are these beautiful, I don't even know what to call them. They're like, they're like, I don't know. <laughs> uh, they're, they're basically hills, but they're like, they just come straight out of the ground in, in these gigantic, it looks like one of those uh, old, woodcuts from asian mythology of like the, the giant sea turtles with the islands mm-hmm. on their back it's mm-hmm. that kind of sphere and they're just densely densely packed with foliage and it's oh there were like hundreds of them on the way out there it was gorgeous so i'm going to recommend road trips drive somewhere with family or friends or loved ones and if you have time that is and um enjoy god's creation meet people at the end of the trip and uh, enjoy fellowship with uh, with God's saints as well. Sounds yeah. good. I pled going last because I didn't know what I was going to recommend, but now I know <laughs> um, because I was recently on a road trip, a long, long road trip. <laughs> um, and by far our best rest stop was Little America, Wyoming. So I'm going to recommend Little America, Wyoming. Um, it is oh. a town of population, I think, 86 um, and they have 75 cent soft serve. They have a little playground. There's a dinosaur to climb on. There's a bison to climb on. There are penguins on the roof. It's pretty much the magical wonderland of rest stops. <laughs> uh, a friend of mine mentioned that they had not been able to stop there on a recent trip. And so they said, stop there if you can, because I need to know if it's as weird as it sounds. And it definitely was. And it was 100 percent worth it. So if you are in the vicinity of I-80 on the western side of Wyoming, go to Little America. It's great. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much for this conversation. It's Thank been you a both. delight. Thanks also to David, our producer and my lawfully wedded husband, who has not done any freezer misdeeds since that first one. So Thanks also to you, our listeners. We really appreciate you tuning in. I uh, hope you're enjoying our return to normal scheduling. Uh, thanks to our financial supporters. We really appreciate you. Um, if you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. You can send us an email at halting towards Zion at gmail.com. Tell us about your favorite road trip stops and your favorite freezer disasters. And uh, yeah, look forward to hearing from you. See you next week. Thank you.